And good evening. It's Jeff here from Home Renovision. Today we are talking all about the state of the trades, specifically in North America. But I think what we're dealing with is a global phenomenon. Let's face it, uh, we've got baby boom itis going on in the trades. So we're going to answer questions today like, uh, what trade is the best one to get into? If you're looking to get in the job, what's the one that makes you the most money? What's the most flexible? What one pushes you to the place where you can be your own boss, the fastest and easiest to make the most money, right? Which one is easiest on the body? Which one is like just quality of life? Like there's a lot of questions to unpack. So we're going to go tackle all of that today. All right. Cheers, everybody. Welcome to our live show. We do this every Tuesday from now until I die. Um, really loving hanging out with my community and talking with you guys, getting some interactions. We are going to also be taking some live calls later on. But guess what? We got a new phone number. That's right. I went out and got a new SIM card for the cell phone. So I'm going to be swapping it out so that I can take live calls on the speakerphone and we can answer some of these questions because it's not enough to know what the problems are with the trade scenario. It's not enough if you're young and you're looking to get in the trades to, to, to get some direction. What we need is solutions. Like nobody is talking about solutions to the problem, right? And so today we're going to talk about solutions to the problem. Why are we so far behind in getting trained people in the job? So without any further ado, let's just jump right into it, shall we? First question. Let's, let's talk first of all to the group of folks who are thinking about getting a job, getting into the trades, right? Looking at that as a career. Because the truth is you can get into the trades, into this world as a job or as a career. If you're looking for a career, then I don't even know what's going on. I'm getting all kinds of new dinging going on with my phone. If you're looking at getting a career in the trades, I'm going to say this. First of all, things are different than when I was young. I'll give you a little history. When I got started in the trades, I was about five years behind the average curve, right? Like everybody in the baby boom was five years ahead of me. They had it locked down. Every contract you can imagine, every government contract, every really good situation. They were all situated. They had their relationships. They had their network. They had their feeds. I showed up. I was a bottom feeder. I was like an outsider. I was like, I, I was, I was, I was new in my own country. I didn't have a clue who any of the players were. I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't know how to go and find a client. And they were very hard to find because we had an abundance of skilled trades in the business already. So for me, I was had to hustle. So that's why I went a couple of years of this, a couple of years of that, a couple of years of this. I figured the best solution for me was to be a bit more of a jack of all trades, you know, right? Have a nice, well-rounded scenario so that I could specialize on doing bathrooms only. So that's the path that I took. But today, the market is different. Today, there is an abundance of gap. There's a huge skills gap out in the workforce. So you have an opportunity now where you could specialize. And there's no right answer, right? Should you be an electrician or a plumber or a welder? Should you get into auto mechanics? Like there's so many things, tile setting, painting, roofing, uh, concrete. Like what do you want to do? Do you want to be a mason? Like there's so many different skills when it comes to working with your hands. You just got to find out what you like. So it doesn't hurt to take a year or two and try a few different jobs. See what you find personally satisfying and, and what floats your boat, right? And at the end of the day, if you're happy doing it and you find any sense of joy or meaning in doing it, then you should stick with it because that's a great place to be. People ask me this question sometimes about the work-life balance. And I'm like, listen, the work-life balance, that's, that's for people who have the right to choose. You got to have enough money to be able to even make that on the list. When I was young, I had four babies to feed. I was always broke. I was always struggling. I was always hustling. I never even considered the idea of having a balance. For me, balance was I can't pay rent, right? <laughs> the minute I was tilted the other side, like I had a few, a few extra bucks in my pocket, I was on a plane and taking my wife on a holiday. And that was my balance. Three or four times in my whole life, I was on the other side of the balance, and that's what I did with my time. Anyway, let's stop just rambling on about me and my life because nobody really cares. Let's talk about some trade questions out there, okay? First of all, uh, I'm going to refer to my notes here. Yeah, what trade should I get into? Well, let's just face it, we do have a problem. We haven't been encouraging anybody to think along the lines of working with your hands and building something and looking back and go, hey, I did that. Having satisfaction, meaning and purpose. No, 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 no. We want everybody in a cubicle, playing on computers. I don't even know why people even think that's a job, all right? You're all gonna get replaced if you're doing that right now. 
fess up. I remember the days we had a company here in Ottawa called Nortel. Huge campus. They had multiple places. They employed thousands and thousands of people. That sucker went belly up. And overnight, I think it was like 12,000 people needed a job. I remember hundreds of them entering into the trades after that because they were done playing the, 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 the high-tech billionaire game, all right? So the truth is this. If you were looking for a career change, and a lot of people do this on a regular basis, consider joining the trades. It's a place where you get satisfaction. You can see what you built, right? You get to go home and go, I made that. <sighs> I am contributing to society, right? <laughs> it's a wonderful feeling. Now, if you want to know which ones make the best money, it really makes no difference. The trade that makes the most money is the one that you're running. If you're an employee, you're always an employee. They're always getting you for half price. But if you uh, go to the school and you get your certificate, you get the license. You don't just wire boxes for an electrician. You become the master electrician. You can run your own show. And when you're running your own show, that's where the money is. All right. So if you want to know who makes the most money, the guy that gets the most education. So I know it might look like it can take a while to get there. But two to five years to become a master of something in today's economy is money in the bank for the rest of your damn life. No one's going to be interrupting your cash flow forever because we don't have enough of us to go around. Okay. When I was a kid, becoming an electrician would take two to three years. I did not have the luxury of the time and that bad poor paycheck to get started. But right now, if you're young, you want to become an electrician in three years? I'm telling you right now, you're going to be writing yourself a six-figure paycheck in three years. And in five years, you can become your own operator. And then it's, there's, there's, the sky's the limit. Okay? So consider that. Someone who's got a master certificate in any trade right now has a license to print money. Plant your tree in your backyard in five years. Poof, there you go. Okay? So I don't care if you want to be a welder or whatever. Pick a trade. Pick something that you like. Become a master at it, not a jack at it. Because today's environment is different than it used to be. Today, a master of something is worth a lot of cash, okay? And all the legislation and all the rules and regs for running a business funnel down to being the master is the guy that gets to write the biggest check. So that's where the money is, all right? Find something you enjoy, and that's awesome. Now, we're going to take some calls. I'm really looking forward in a few minutes to take some calls. Guys, if you're in the trades, if, you, if you're in, a, in an area where the, the, your governments are coming up with solutions to the problem, because let's face it, there's over a million guys sitting at home. Maybe you're watching the video right now. You don't have a job. You've been disenfranchised from the community of life. I get it. You know, <laughs> it's been an interesting couple of years, right? Bottom line, this isn't temporary. And you've got to take a look at your, your, your lifestyle and your trade and your job as a career path. Where are you going to be in 20, 30 years if you don't start now? You're going to kick yourself if you ignore the opportunity that's in the trade sector and you wait another few years because you could be the guy that's the master of something, writing your own check, working a four-day work week if you want to, doing whatever work-life balance you're interested in because there's going to be such a demand and not enough supply for decades to come. It's not a week or two. This is not a temporary problem. We are stuck where we are for a long, 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 long time. Okay. All right. Uh, um, let's talk about this. Which trade is easiest to get started? Now, this is going to change by, by district because we have different rules all over the place. Ontario, where I am, if you want to become an electrician, it's two years to three years. Plumbers, very same because what you do is a little bit of schooling and then some practical and then some more schooling and then more practical. Part of the problem is if you want to be a tradesman nowadays, you can't just become a residential tradesman like Texas. Texas has a program where you can become a residential electrician. Great. That's about as simple as it gets, right? You can train up an electrician in about 30 days to do wiring in a, in a residential home. It's not rocket science. But for whatever reason, most of our trades, our college of trades, our governments, they want you to be, join the military. Ready? Here's the analogy. They want you to learn how to be in the Army, the Marines, the Navy, and the Air Force. And they want you to know every position before they give you a ticket. That's just the dumbest damn thing I've ever heard. We need people out there now to solve the problem with the bottleneck. Government people, listen, all of you in suits and ties, pay attention. Find a way to make it easier to get people employed getting a full-time salary 
so we don't have to wait two to five years. Have you noticed the cost of living has gone up a little bit? If you want people to wait two to five years to get a ticket so that they can get a regular paying job, you're dreaming. And you're going to be the one calling for a plumber when your toilet's overflowing and no one's coming to save you because you made your own mess. All right? Let's just think about that. Okay. Now, which one's in the highest demand? Hmm. All of them. That's the easiest way to answer that question. They're all in high demand. From every level, of, from, from commercial to new home construction to service people, like you want to talk about uh, your work-life balance, don't get into service. But you want to make money, get into service. Be the 24-7 guy, 365. That's where the money is. You can show up at a door and say, yeah, I know, lady, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, but you want me to fix it or what? Yeah, okay. Well, if it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it'd be 200. But at 3 in the morning, honey, it's 600 bucks. You want it or not? That's the market we're in right now, okay? So, you know, you can consider that. Maybe working nice isn't a bad thing. <laughs> now, people have always asked me this question too. Say, what's hardest on the body? The answer to that is tile. Being a tile set is probably by far, and if you don't agree with me, jump in the comment section and let me know. Tile set was the most difficult job I ever had. You're doing a lot of heavy lifting. You're always on your knees. You're always bent over carrying weight. Okay. At the end of the day, you stand up and you stretch, and it's like all you can do just to look like a homo sapien, right? You're, oh, that's just brutal. But these guys, if you're good at it, okay, and you get a nice combination of floor and wall tile, and you're very creative and you get into custom bathroom work, you can make an absolute fortune as a tile set. Hmm. All right. Now, listen, one more thing. When it comes to getting into the trades, we have one more kind of trade I don't talk about. And that is, yeah. The weekender, right? The Saturday trade. All of you guys out there that are starting your own business so that you can take your after-tax dollars instead of spending it on your phone and your car and everything else, you move that into business expenses, which is before tax expenses, right? Great concept. We're going to have a video on that soon talking about how to manipulate your life to do that. But if you are, um, how shall we say it? You're into the, the gig economy. You're going to work Saturdays. You're going to work for yourself. You're going to do a little something. You're going to do, provide a service. Okay. You're going to do patch drywall or you're going to clean gutters or use a pressure washer or whatever you want to do. Everything is in such high demand right now. It's not that tricky to get started. All right. Now, listen, today's video, guys, is sponsored by Jobber. I love these people and I'm not afraid to say so. You know me. I don't take sponsorships. Right. But Jobber, let me tell you, if I had them around when I was in, in the trades, it would have changed my whole life. My profitability would have went through the roof because they are the strength in every single one of my weaknesses. They keep you organized. They run your email. They run your invoicing. They, they keep reminding customers. They've got email campaigns going on. They organize everything on a one little app so it's all right there in front of your face. You can stay organized as you drive around. Back when I was young, we used to have a computer and I'd use my cell phone as a hotspot just to plug my computer in so I could update my files. It was maddening. Jobber makes life simple for you guys. And if you like Check the link in the video description. we got a free 14-day trial for you. So if you're looking to starting a small business or you're doing one now and you're in over your head and you need some help, check them out. I've gone through the program. I've taken the test drive on it. I think it's awesome. You're going to love it. Now, let's just jump into some questions here. We'll see what the community has got to say about the situation dealing with the trades. And is it really a problem? Is it, is it, or is it good? Is it good that the whole world is coming to realize that we need people who are going to work blood, sweat, and tears? We need people who are willing to get dirty. And maybe, just maybe, for the first time in history, the guys who work hard are going to get some bloody respect. Anyway, uh, I've got Matt helping me out with the questions. Thanks, buddy. He's over in Ottawa. Let me just jump in here. Mary says, I'm a business manager by day. And framer, drywaller, painter, electrician, oh my goodness, by night. That is a lot of work, Mary, but you know what? There's the answer to your work-life balance question. There is none. Now is the season to work, okay? If you still have air in your lungs and three calories of worth of energy, put it to work. It's the season for it. You're going to get maximum dollar right now. Bottom line, Mary's got it right. I'm going to be doing a video soon. It's going to be called The Millionaire Painter. That's right. You can make an absolute fortune as a painter in today's society. And you don't have to work 200 hours a week. All right. Let's jump in another question here. Big Man Tang, any way to learn a trade on a part-time basis? You know, that's a great question. 
Um, there are a couple of things you can do on the part-time basis. You can join a renovation crew working part-time. And so that's your opportunity to um, like glean from the trades, right? These guys, you can, you, they'll put you to work. You can be their assistant and you can just learn from observation, okay? And then when you've gotten some respect and some rapport, ask questions. They don't mind training. I, I love training guys when I had them around. It's, it's kind of like, it's a bit of a brotherhood, right? So that is one way that you can do it. If you can get a part-time job working with the trades or a renovation crew, you get exposed to all of that, then it makes all of life a little bit easier. And not everything that you want to do in this business requires a ticket, right? You can do a lot of things without getting a licensed ticket. You might not be able to work for the unions, but let's say you work for a renovation crew like I did, and I painted for about a year and a half. I became a pretty damn good painter. And I went and started my own paint company as a result of that. And you know what? My clients never had a problem with the quality of my work because I was trained by the pros. So that is a great way to get started. If you're concerned about the affordability of getting in the trades, becoming a painter is a great way to start, right? Because you can learn that in three to six months. And then you can go and launch out yourself and then put your skills to work right away. You get paid while you're getting trained. And then you can get really paid by running a business. All right. Next question. Mira wants to know, I do tile and just charge per hour, but always doesn't seem enough. But I don't how, know how to charge differently. Any tips? Wow, Mira. I guess it all comes down to what you're charging per hour. But if it doesn't seem like enough, it's because you're thinking of yourself as an employee. Okay? You're looking through the lens of a boss and what they would pay you by the hour. You go work at, at Walmart, they're going to give you 18 bucks an hour. Don't charge like you work for a Walmart, okay? I want you to understand, guys, everybody out there that's charging low money, you're getting so taken advantage of. Don't let somebody make $150 an hour pay you $20 or $30 an hour when they can't do the job themselves. They need to hire you. you are, your time is now worth the same as theirs. Did you hear what I said? If someone's making $100 an hour and they can't do something because you've got the skill and they don't, and there's no one else around willing to answer the phone to do the job, you are now worth at bare minimum what they're worth per hour. And you can trade your skill for their money. That's why they go to work, to earn money, to hire skills that they don't have. You're worth a lot more. The best thing you can do, Myra, is just raise your rates. And then in a few months, raise them again. And then you can, you can adjust and you can say, hey, they're all willing to pay that and they're happy paying that. There's no headwind. I'll try again. And over the next course of the next year, you could have three or four pay raises. Find out where you actually fit in the marketplace because it's an impossible question to answer. A lot of it's geography. How big is the city? What is the market? Are you in New York? Are you in, in like a small town Mississippi? There's so many changes, right? But you can change your rate and see what the market will bear. That's a business term. What will the market bear? How much are they, are they gonna be happy to pay that? And when they start to get upset that they have to pay that, maybe you're walking into that place where you're going to have the odd customer start to stiff you. So back the pressure off a little bit so they're all still happy to pay. Cheers. All righty then. Triple D, I'm considering property maintenance. Any advice? <laughs> Organization is my advice. Because in property maintenance, you're dealing with so many different clients. You've got to have an app like a job or system going on. you got to stay so focused. And if you're not the... Uh, administrator in your family, then then you need to find someone who can be your administrator or an app that can do it for you. Okay, so consider trying them out. When it comes to property maintenance, though, you're, it's like with anything else. Be careful how many contracts and how much how many promises you make that you, that you can't keep on your own. If guys didn't show up to work, right? You got to really be careful. Always be hiring. Always be hiring, guys. Always be hiring and always be firing. If people can't cut it, you should be hiring all the time. Bring in someone new and cut out the worst one in the bunch. Make sure the whole team knows that they could be the next one on the chopping block to make sure they bring their integrity to the game every damn day. I used to work in a restaurant and every Saturday it was the same thing. The boss would come around the corner. There's four of us in the kitchen. We're all working. It's the same way I got the job on the first day. And they'd say, hey, step aside. He's gonna, we're going to try him out. 
All right. And the boss would sit here and after three minutes, he'd make one of two decisions. I'm hiring this guy and firing him or the guy that I just tried out was lousy. And he'd do the same thing. He'd pull a wad of 20s out of his pocket and pull a couple and say, thanks for trying out. Get out of here. You're lousy. Or he'd pull out a bunch of 20s and goes, you're fired. You, you have a job. It left the entire restaurant working as hard as freaking possible. It's a great skill. If you're always hiring and you're always firing, then you're going to have your staff work in the top of their game. <laughs> Crypto Steph, 47-year-old female looking to get out of health care and enter into the trades. What trade would you recommend? Oh, if you're getting out of health care, I guess it all depends on your, your financial situation. But Steph, honestly, um, getting into being an electrician, it's an amazing gig. It is the perfect world for anybody who is conscientious and organized, okay? Because there's no limit to how much money you can make. In the world of electricians, you guys get paid by production. It's by the job, all right? And if you're in healthcare, then you, you're a worker bee, right? So consider this. It's going to take a couple of years. You're going to take a bit of a hit financially. But then afterwards, you're going to write your own paycheck. And you can work as hard as you want and be as organized as you like. Because I've been on jobs where an electrician can do the same job in one day by himself, or I've had three and four men crews take three days to do the same job. They're full of incompetent boobs, all right? If you are not an incompetent boob and you want to go and make a killing, you can get in the electrical world because you charge by the job, you charge by the fixture, and you can make a killing. Cheers. And it's relatively clean work, especially new construction, right? You get into the renovation world, become like a, a renovation contractor electrician, they, they clean everything up. They frame everything out. You're in a nice, clean space. You walk in. You're the only one working because everyone else has to be out of your way when you're there. What a great gig. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Martin wants to know, what do you think of a cider? I've been doing it for 15, 17 years. Listen, there ain't no joke. Vinyl siding is a real gig, right? You've got to first not be afraid of heights. <laughs> you're working on those skinny little ladders, right? You're working up the side of the house. Ciders are a great gig. Listen, I don't think it's a licensed trade, but it is definitely a niche labor market. Something to consider, guys. If you're not afraid of heights, working on vinyl siding, it's all about production, right? Getting the job done. If you like to work hard and get paid based on, on production and peace instead of by the hour, that is a great option as well. Cheers, Martin. Appreciate you bringing that up. Thanks, man. All right, Max. Wouldn't the deficit of professionals affect quality of work, quantity over... Uh, quality, quantity over quality. This might be an opportunity for the trades, but definitely not a good thing for the consumer. You know, I'm, I'm going to just say this, Max. Um, 30, 40 years ago, they took shop class out of high school and they knew that wasn't good for the consumer. They did it to themselves. Who, whoever's brainchild it was to say, we're not going to need people to work in the future. We're going to let robots build everything. They were dummies. All right. Whatever they did to design a society that was top heavy on the white collar and nobody working for a living, they're going to get what's coming to them because our working class folks, we take care of ourselves. If you're an electrician and you need a plumber, I'll guarantee you, you get a plumber because they're also going to need an electrician and they're going to need a carpenter. It's a fraternity of brotherhood. Okay. And everybody outside of the working class man who needs help, now they're paying for that help. And it's when I'm bloody well ready to go and help you out. Welcome to the real world, folks. You created it. You decided to look down on working class people as the, the lesser of the society. And now you're paying them like 150, 200 bucks an hour to even show up at your job site. You know why? Because you told everybody that they shouldn't be working with their hands. My God, can I just say this? I am so freaking tired of watching people on social media doing drywall work wearing gloves. Like, it's freaking mud. What are you afraid of? Like, can we just get back to being like men already and go to work and get some blood, sweat, and tears going on? Like, wearing gloves to work with mud? You can't even feel the tools in your hand. How in the hell are you doing your job? All right, next. Ah, uh, Flying Swallow. Jeff, where's the love for auto mechanics on today's complex vehicles? Well, you know what? I get it. I mentioned you guys earlier. Um, I'm not really in the automatic uh, automotive industry, so it's not always top of mind. But I do appreciate the fact that we need them. 
we got a lot of guys out there who are going to have a lot of skilled trades going on, a lot of certificates, a lot of courses, a lot of retraining going on, right? And in Ontario, we don't even, we, we've stopped, catch this, a few years ago, the, Canadian, the Ontario government stopped even investigating if people were actually licensed or, or, or taking the courses. Do they have the competence to do the job? We stopped checking. It's unbelievable what's going on. It's like the first wave of trying to make room for people to work is to say, you got to have a certificate. We're just not going to check. That's just stupid. To me, that's just stupid. If you're going to solve a problem, come out and solve the problem. But don't just like stop looking. You create a gray area where people are going to be gray. And then what? The political wind changes and all of a sudden everybody's a criminal. Like that's just not going to be good for society, guys. Anyway, I love me an auto mechanic. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, if, if, if I'm just saying, if you're going to get dirty for a living, you're in high demand. Yeah, that's just the bottom line. All right. Moving over here. Advice on how to manage snow removal service. Since it's obviously a gamble, there's no work if there's no snow, but equipment needs to be stored and maintained and ready to go either way. Yeah, I got some advice, Joe. I've signed a few snow contracts over my years. Here's the advice. You get a contract that says that you're going to provide snow service from a date to a date. Make it the heaviest snow in the history, the season, all right? If it snows before or after that date, they pay extra, okay? And you only guarantee a certain number of cleanings, okay? And you only guarantee a certain number of inches per year. You are in the driver's seat, my friend, because no one wants to shovel snow. No one wants to work. So you can write that contract any way you want, okay? You can get paid by snowflake nowadays, Joe. Just saying, Feel free to think outside the box and go, where are my liabilities? What is every single scenario that's going to cost me money that doesn't have a return? Put it in the contract and make them sign it. You are not going to have a hard time getting people to sign that contract. Because if it's anything like me a couple of years ago, I was looking for somebody to do snow. I went through seven companies and I finally found one guy who was a startup. There's nobody out there. You got no competition. So, be picky as you want, be professional, be on time, use a jobber app, right? Make sure that you are in the best communication, you're never late for your appointments, and you have great communication with your clients, and they're gonna have that as perceived value, and you can be the most respected snow guy in your neighborhood, because when it's snowing, you're gonna send out an alert, we're gonna be coming, they're gonna have confirmation, you can have this all automated, all right? You can run an amazing ship from the comfort of your own home on your phone and you can get paid every time a snowflake hits the ground. Cheers. All right, well, here we go. We got the phone call banner going. That's the new number, guys. If you wanna jump in, I'm really interested to talk to you if you're running your own shop or if you're doing a side gig, okay? Or if you've got, uh, if you live in an area where the government's doing something proactive to actually solve the problem and not just pretend like they're solving it, because honestly, we have got a million men sitting at home and we've got a million jobs vacant. There's an equation there. It's kind of obvious. So what are we going to do to incentivize people? I don't have the solutions. Not all of them. Um, the, old, the old man in me says, grab a big stick and start beating them. But that's just not going to work, right? So <laughs> we got to find another thing. You, you can't motivate people in this world except for a very few scenarios. One of the scenarios is, it hurts so bad they've got to make a change, right? And then the other scenario is you, in, you encourage them or inspire them to make a change. Well, there's nothing inspirational going on out there right now. So those guys, that's not going to happen. But if we're paying them to stay at home or parents are letting people live in their basements until they're 35 and 40 without having a job, you're empowering the problem. <sighs> yep, toes, crunch, got it? If you have a grown man living in your house and he's not paying rent, he doesn't have a job, kick his ass out and do society a favor. Make him grow up. All right. That is what 53 years old brings to the table, folks. Listen, if you got a question, I'd love to take your call right here. I am open for business. Until that phone rings, we will continue answering some more questions here, Matt. Artie wants to know, hey, Jeff, what resources do you recommend I check out to learn about home renovations before hiring a GC to renovate my bungalow? Oi, 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 oi. The best thing you got. You can forget about all the research. The best research you got is on the job. You find out where that GC is working right now. And you tell him, listen, I'm going to come talk to your current client. You go to that house. 
You go check out, are they clean? Are they organized? What do the crew look like, right? Are they a bunch of cokeheads? I mean, you'll know right away. Are they all sitting out at the end of the driveway sucking on a reefer or are they working? Is the client happy? What's the quality of the work look like? All these questions can be answered in a 15 minute visit. And a guy who won't let you come visit his current site is the guy who's trying to hide something. And that is all you need to know. Cheers. Oh, Max again, a bit of clarification from my part. When there's a deficit of contractors, every trade wants to ride the wave and take as many contracts as possible. Why do 10 quality jobs when you can do 30 so-and-so? Hmm. Not sure I really get your gist here. Listen, this is not a wave, okay? This is a new tide. This is a tide that's gonna be around for 30 years. We have a brand new risen tide. Bottom line, we have a whole North American continent. Half of this continent was built before 1980. It needs maintenance. It needs repairs. It's cheaper to do maintenance and repairs than build new. Here we go. So that's the market. It's cheaper to fix it than it is to do it again. All right, we're going to answer this. Hello, Jeff here. Who am I speaking with? Hi, Jeff. This is Andrew. Andrew, nice to talk to you, buddy. What's that? You got a question for me or a comment or a solution to this mess, maybe? Yeah, I've got a question, actually. Totally sure. unrelated. I'm 24. I'm from Canada, Toronto. And I'm doing a basement bathroom renovation myself. It's At my 24, congratulations. Is it your parents' house or are you a homeowner already? Oh, this is my parents' house. Okay. I wish I could own a home in this area. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's always the lottery. All right, so what's up, buddy? What do you need help with? Uh, yeah, I just want to know, like, things are going smoothly so far. I've pretty much wrapped up all the demolitions. I've been watching your videos faithfully. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working through anything, everything. Is there any, uh, you know, like, tips or things that I might not – think about, but should probably consider. Okay, so here, Andrew, thanks for the call. I got the answer to your question right here. Yeah. What you need to do is take a look at all the risk reward and risk management that you have in front of you and say, you know what? For five bucks a month for the next two months, I could join Jeff's membership program on the YouTube channel and I can send him a picture and then I can see where you are and you can tell me what your plan is and then I can actually help diagnose a solution to your problem and a path forward that'll save you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Okay. Okay. If you don't have enough experience to know exactly where you're going, the first thing you need to do is know what the end looks like and how to get there. And I can help you with that plan. All right. All right, buddy. Hit that so join okay. button and I will see you in the comment section on our membership forum. Okay. All right. All right. You can do this, buddy. And I'm, I'm here to help. We'll get it done together. All right. Thanks, man. Cheers, Have buddy. Have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye. There you go. 24 years old. huh? Grabbing life by the... <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Listen, I went to the Bell store to get the SIM card. Shout out to the guy from the Bell store. Just stopped dead in his tracks. Knew who I was. He was watching my videos. Over the last three years, he has rehabbed two properties and turned himself into a landlord. And he's looking to do his third. Based on our videos on the channel, folks. Okay. Young guy. Took advantage of it. Did it in a small town where, where, where the cost of the houses were cheap, but he got it done. And now he's on his way to success. Blood, sweat, and tears pays, folks. Hello, Jeff here. Who am I speaking with? Hi, Jeff. This is, uh, my name is Russ, electrical contractor. Russ. I'm just watching, yes, I'm just watching your YouTube, uh, your video on YouTube. You're streaming right now, right? Yes, sir. Question. Yeah. How do you avoid the problem with the pain? Like through the process of 12 years in the business as an independent contractors, I have like issues running into, you do it as somebody as like a favor, like first time project, second time project, and then you're running into the problem, they don't pay you. Yeah, yeah. You go to the court, you sue them, and eventually be lucky if you're gonna get a quarter out of the money you invest and your time and your labor and all the, uh, the bonuses and perks you're doing for the guy. Yeah. Like, like, it's it's maddening, isn't it? I, I, okay, Russ, I got your answer for you. Hang on, right here. Ready? Here's your answer. Whatever you're charging to do your job, add 30%. Okay. 
Okay? Society has gone mad. 30% of the society is not going to pay their bill. Do your best in your contract to add um, um, interim payments. Because if you're waiting to get paid after the permit is, is passed, then they're sitting in the driver's seat. And they know it takes time and money to go to court. They know it's a pain in the ass. I've had clients stiff me for one, three, five thousand dollars and they just laugh at you when you when they do it because because they know you're not going to do anything about it, right? Now I do know some electrical contractors who will actually show up in the middle of the night and they'll drill out the sidewalls and people's tires just to get even. But hey, you know that's that's uh, that's not my advice. I'm just saying I know it happens. The best thing you can do to protect yourself from that kind of client is to overcharge everybody. And if you've got a good client and they pay you, you can give them a rebate. Sense. You know, like, you got to get paid, reason. dude. Yeah. I know. Yeah, that's, that's and, and especially that's being that's in that's Canada, the, the, the legal system is not an easy thing to navigate. Now, you can try putting liens on people's properties. Have you done that before? Uh, well, in this case, like for everybody who is in the lien, it's not uh, something that will help you. It's, uh, first of all, it costs around 2500 Yeah, I know. Uh, in a year and a half, you have to resolve it. So yep. it can be very costly for you. Right? I get it. I get it. And so yes. here's here's the I only mean, th the biggest challenge no. we got is that yeah. the lean cycle is absolute cash grab. But our entire legal system is so far behind on everything they're doing. Any kind of legal action takes years to move forward, thousands to invest. You'll end up putting more money in than you're going to get back. So the answer to the question is, since society sucks and they don't want to pay contractors, just overcharge everybody. And then the people you really love, you can give them a rebate. Oh, makes sense. All right. Sense. It, it, yeah. how, how many times in the last two years have you raised your prices? Well, uh, with every time I shopping, well, for every project, I like do in a separate price quote. So I'm like, this is my hourly rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I break down the projects. I don't know if you have the time, but so the building the new house residential so i'm putting one price for the just the basic yep. astro code yep and then hot lights cameras sound speakers yep. anything like that it goes on top of that and that's very right but how many times in the last two years have you said okay so let's say it's twenty dollars for a box every light switch is 20 bucks how many times in the last two years have you gone it's gone from 20 to 25 to 30 to 40 bucks? are you doing that aggressively right now Okay, that's so one, that's the reason I I quit the, my kind of business in Ontario. I moved to Alberta because I want to start fresh. Yeah, I want to kind of cancel all this stuff and just start a new way. I get it. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, it's it's maddening. Probably. At the end of the yeah, day, it's, it's it's like being a waiter. Not every table tips. Not everybody's going to pay. Okay, so you give great service to everybody, but you overcharge everybody, and then the ones who don't pay. You can then decide if you want to take the time and energy to chase after them, all right? But the ones who are, are good clients and repeat clients, then you can start lowering your price for a repeat client. But make sure you get paid way higher than you should be the first time. And that'll, if they hire you three times and screw you on the third time, you got paid for that the first time. Makes sense? Well, let's say it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like, uh, I know it's maddening. Uh, if you start charging over, the business is not going each. They were looking for somebody's well, 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 no, hold on, hold on. That, that's that's a 10 year old concept. You can't look at yourself like that anymore because there's not enough guys to do the job. You were going to be absolutely yeah, amazed right. if you start challenging your pricing and start raising it on a regular basis every three to six months. Raise your pricing, challenge it, see if you get the clients. Keep track of how many jobs you close versus how many you lose. You might be amazed to find out that you are pricing yourself 30 to 50% lower than you should be. Almost every trade I know does this. We have a sense of community and I don't wanna, I don't wanna overcharge people, but look at it this way. Every job you did in the last two years for 10 grand, the homeowner made $20,000 on asset value in their home. Right? Well, we're not supposed, to be, do, we're not supposed to be making the homeowner money here, buddy. We're supposed to be making, giving them good value so if the homeowner's making more money than you are, you're, you're being too cheap. 
And it's and it's hard when the market changes aggressively like it has to to make that shift, right? But you've got to try. You got to you got to push your numbers every three months until you see that you're finding resistance with your numbers. And it can't be your own psychology. It has to be actual clients saying, "No, I don't want to do this. You're too expensive." And until you find that level, you're working too cheap, bud. Okay, I see. All right. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, that's my phone number. If there's any electrical question you need to I, it, Listen, you're just trying to bring value yeah. to your customer. I understand. But they've already got the value. Because the houses are worth so much more nowadays. Every every dollar you put in that job is worth two dollars now versus what it was two years ago. Right. You gotta come up, you gotta you gotta get up to market rate, bud. Or they're gonna take a look at you and they're gonna think, ah, he's cheap. That means I can take advantage of him. And that might be why you're finding these clients. I see. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. If there's any questions needed, there you go. Like my number in the I appreciate it, buddy. And listen, go get paid and enjoy your day, huh? Thank you. Appreciate you, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Listen, that's a common thing. Guys, we're so used to thinking, well, everything's gone crazy, and I'm going to raise my prices 3 or 5% this year. The hell with that. When you're in the trades, you look at what your job is creates in net asset value, you're worth that net asset value. Every renovation for the last 100 years got 80 cents on the dollar return on investment because the electrician created $10,000 in value and he charged 10 grand. Well, now it's worth 20, so start charging. All right, we're gonna see how this works out. This says suspected spam. Hello, Jeff here. Oh. <laughs> Hang on a second. Here we go. Hello. Hi, is this Jeff? Yes, sir. Hi, I had some questions for you. I don't know if you're still doing your live podcast. Still, in, your... still in the middle of the live show, my man. Go ahead and shoot. Fantastic. My name is Rick, and I'm from the Tri City, Ontario, and I'm a young carpentry apprentice. Tri City. So you're talking Kitchener, Cambridge, Guelph. That's it. You got it. Boom. I, I grew up down that neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, I'm right in the Cambridge area, actually. Okay. So, <laughs> Preston, Galt, or Hessler? Oh, even better. <laughs> I'm a gold guy. You're a gold guy. Okay, yeah. north or south? Uh, west side, actually. West side gold. Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. Over by the park. I get it. So, hit okay. me. What's your question? All right. So, I'm trying to figure out how to go forwards because I was with a good framing company. Yep. And, unfortunately, with the market, they had to let a lot of guys go, had to lay them off. So I've been bumping around between companies, companies. A lot of guys are getting started up, and I'm trying to find a good one to stick with for a while. Um, can't really find one just yet. It's like throwing darts at a board with a blindfold on. You okay, know? question, because I'm familiar with the market. You guys are out of dirt in Cambridge. Yeah. There's nowhere left to build. You've, you've exceeded all of your boundaries. That's right. So, so I'm starting to look at renovations. I'm starting to look at other ones because, again, carpentry goes over a lot of different aspects. Yeah, I get it. The renovation market is a little more wild west, okay? And what you're going to find is it's uh, it's going to be inconsistently professional. Okay. All right? You might be better off to be willing to travel. Okay. Um, take a look at Air. Take a look at Guelph. Take a look at uh, Kitchener-Waterloo. Or, or even take a look at relocating to where they're building like Mad Men, right? Okay. And put yourself in a new job market. All right. And what's your opinion on unions? You know what? 50-50. Okay. If, if you are a guy who is incredibly ambitious, no. But if okay. you're looking for a work-life balance, then it's a beautiful thing. No, I'm already starting to take on side jobs, and I'm looking to go out on my own once I get my ticket. Yeah. Well, you know what? If you need to put in more hours to get your ticket, you're going to do some traveling, and it's worth doing because Cambridge is all full up. There's not another square foot to build another house down there. Right. All right. And you know what? Okay. It's not a big deal because uh, Milton's, what, 30 minutes away? That's right. Yeah. Well, they're building like madmen out there. They'd hire you tomorrow. All right. I'll start looking at Milton. That's All right, buddy. Good. You take care. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Cheers. This is fun. I love taking phone calls. That's awesome. From the old stomping ground. That's awesome. Cambridge, Ontario. Yeah. Newfoundland's looking for carpenters all the time in the chat here. Uh, Electricians are literally the lowest paid trade. Duck Slayer, you're so wrong about that. The, the, a lot of the guys that don't have their ticket yet are getting 25, 30 bucks, right? But those things are changing. And guys, if you're working for an electrician, you haven't got your ticket yet, but you're doing the work, consider this. I just told the electrician to double his rates. You should too. 
Yeah, there's no reason why a guy who hasn't got his ticket yet, but he's doing the work, can't make 45, 50 bucks an hour if an electrician is billing him out at 100. So consider that conversation with the boss. All right. Hey, Jeff here. Who am I speaking with? Sean, how you doing, bud? Is that Sean? Is that what I heard that right? Yes, sir. All right, Sean. Where are you from, buddy? Uh, Georgetown. Where? Um, Georgetown. Georgetown, Ontario. Ontario? Yes, sir. Wow. Fantastic. All right. So what kind of trade are you into? I am uh, okay. For starters, huge fan. Uh, <laughs> I got a little home reno project. I, I look up your videos for tips. Thank you. Well, <laughs> hey, listen, um, I'm, I'm not an expert at everything, but I'm just I'm just trying to share what I've learned, and then hopefully yeah. helping people out a little bit because I grew up in a world where no one wanted to share nothing, and Absolutely. that was frustrating because you know they had nothing to lose by sharing, and so I'm just uh, I'm loving my life, making a living, helping people. So let's get to Thank your you. question, bud. I do have a question, uh, one little tip. I, I always had like a side gig on the side. Yeah. Anyone looking for seed money, um, you know, it's pretty easy to go rent a lawn aerator for four hours from Home Depot for 80 bucks. Yeah. And then go to some knock on doors and just be like, you rent the machine, you're going to come 80 bucks, you're going to get a sunburn, you're going to do this. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it for you for 60, and then you get 10 of those houses and you're tired at the end of the day, but you got 600 bucks in your pocket to seed money. <laughs> Dude, I love um, it. To, that is the kind of ingenuity that we need. You know, like uh, there's, there's all kinds of room for doing that kind of stuff, blood, sweat, and tears. So you're just, you're just out there poking holes that. in people's yards for them. And then I use that seed money to buy a driveway sealing machine and you're spraying a driveway. And uh, you know what? That built up to anytime I want it on a weekend, I'm making two grand. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, yeah, you don't need to necessarily go through a million pounds of training. You just got to be willing to work and try to get up so people call you back. You know what? Um, that is great advice because the truth of it is, is there, there's not just a need for tradesmen. There's a need for anybody who's involved in home maintenance, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and all absolutely. kinds of people out there are deferring maintenance because they can't do it themselves. They can't find help. And if you can fill that void, you can really maximize. You can leverage the fact that you got a tool and you can yeah, leverage absolutely. that and do really well. Yeah. And uh, but, uh, my main question is, is basically I'm doing kind of a built-in thing around my TV, uh, including a fireplace. Yeah. I got to the point where all the framing's done yep. and realized that uh, maybe I didn't make the studs as much as I could be. Would Should I take a, try to rent a planer and shave down the other ones or just use shims before I put up a board for tile? Okay. So if you're going to go with tile, there's two options because tile is a little forgiving. Is it like a ledge stone you're going to do? It's uh, they're like three and a half foot by five foot tiles. Uh, so okay, so the bigger the tile, the more perfect the frame has to be. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's your answer right there. So getting a hand planer and and yeah. making everything perfect before you move forward is a great idea because a two by four framing is it? Yeah. Okay, so you'll be able to hold that with two by three framing. All right. So don't be afraid to plan it and make it as perfect as you can. That'll make the tile a lot easier to do. All right, buddy. Yeah. I'm going to have to run because I forgot I got call waiting on this phone. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. All right. There we go. And I lost both of them. Okay. Sorry. Call back if that was you. I apologize. My goodness. Oh, be a handyman. You know, the greatest, the greatest thing right now is to be a handyman. You don't have to be a master of all trades. You don't have to be a jack of all trades. You don't have to go into the workforce and, and spend years and years and years. We have got a 30-year cycle where you can just rent out the fact that you're willing to get dirty. Do simple things. Simple maintenance. Because people are deferring maintenance. The more they defer maintenance, the bigger the cost of the repair. So they're more than happy to pay for services rendered. And in a lot of cases, up front, right? So consider that. Now, we are at uh, 549. we got about 10 minutes left, guys. If you got a question or you got a solution or you come from another neighborhood where Governments are making some rule changes. I'd love to hear it. So far, no one's called with government changing any rules. Apparently, they like not being able to find a plumber. All right, another call from Ontario. Hello, Jeff here. Who am I speaking with? Hi, Jeff. Uh, my name is KJ. KJ, what kind of what kind of question you got there for me, buddy? Uh, so I live in Toronto, Ontario, and the um, I own uh, about six hundred forty square feet condo and. Yep. Um, I'm getting married next month, so my fiance wanted to, you know, do some wholesome of uh, 
painting done. So I did my entire <laughs> unit uh, painted. Uh, I bought a paint from Home Depot. I know you probably Ugh, don't like that. Cringe. <laughs> yeah, I know it's okay. I, uh, I understand. So, so I've been doing that for past three weeks, and then she ended up saying, like, like she wants to know if I save that bunch of money by doing myself, or should I have, you know, just sign up the contract or something. So mm. I mean, I, I honestly I never got any quotes, so I don't know what the market price are, but I've done it in about fourteen hundred dollars worth of I paint. Was wondering, uh, it was a. Uh, the bear marquee. Oh, you went you went up to that eighty dollar level, did you? Yeah, and then <laughs> I did a whole cabinet and everything. So okay. I mean, by the way, your video really helped. Oh, that, that's great, great to hear. So you're wanting to know what the market rate for labor is for painting a six hundred and forty square foot apartment? Yeah, about that. Okay, it's about thirty five hundred bucks. Just so you know. Thirty. Now, okay. three years ago, right. it would have been about twenty five hundred bucks. Okay. And 10 years ago, it would have been about 800 bucks. I still ended up saving like two grand on it. Okay. Easy. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm just talking labor. No, I'm not talking about labor and material. Oh, yeah. just labor. Yeah. Because, you know, like when you're running a business, half of the money you make as a business is not income. It's expenses. Right. Right. So if it takes a week to do a job and you charge 3500 you made seventeen. Well, if you live in Toronto and you're making less than six or eight thousand dollars a month, you're not surviving. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So yeah, you know. I can feel that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, it's it's real numbers we're talking, and that's fine. But yeah, you you probably you probably did two or three thousand dollars of the labor without even thinking about it. All right. And not just that, but you also increase the value of your apartment by five percent by giving it a refresh. Yeah. Yep. So you get the asset plus the savings on the labor. And you put in your own blood, sweat, and tears. That's what DIY is all about, friend. That is what it's all about. So good awesome. on you. Thanks for the tip and the. Uh, and so when you tell her, tell her it was thirty-five. It'll make her even extra happy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, KJ. Thanks for the call, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, thanks. All right, man. Have thanks a great night. Bye. bye, bye. There we go. We got time for one more call, uh, Matt. Maybe we can throw in a couple of questions here, real quick. We'll see if we can we can answer some stuff here. Oh my goodness, this is so much fun. Guys, I just love doing these live shows. Every Tuesday, we're gonna be here, so join us. Um, Crypto Cash says, Crypto Steph, I'm doing a basement reno. I use two inch foam boards on exterior walls, spray foamed any cracks, put up the frame, insulated mineral wool. Do I need a vapor barrier before I put up sheetrock? New York State, yes. You're in four season climate and it gets cold. Do a vapor barrier, and if you're not, completely confident with that answer, check your local building office and ask what is the code where you are. You don't have to tell them where you live to get the answer. Cheers. Hello, Christopher. What can I do Hi for there. you? I'm sorry. I'm tripping over process. myself trying to answer multiple questions here. That's all good. <laughs> I So I'm doing my basement right now. Yes, sir. And I'm doing my drywall. And I thought, I get, I'm getting all sorts of recommendations. And one of them is pre-cut all my pot lights, all my outlets, all that fun stuff, or do it in place. And I know watching some of your videos, you do them all in place. I'm just wondering which one is the easiest if I measure everything out. Well, what you really want to do is, like, with, do you have a roto zip tool? Like the little, 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 the spinning blade that we use as a guide to cut out the drywall? Do you have something like that? A drywall uh, cutout tool? Get one. Okay, well you could get one, right? How many yeah. drywall jobs are you gonna do in your life? Uh, yeah, th that's the answer right there, isn't then, it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that tool's on Kijiji next week, right? All right, yeah. here's the deal. The, the, it's not as easy to get to learn how to use that as you might think. So by the time you get a hang of it, you're already have gonna install most of your basement and cut big chunks of drywall away from your boxes that need patch repair anyway. So it's not much different than pre-cutting and then installing. Because then if you make a mistake pre-cutting, you're gonna have to fix it as you install. So it's about, it, it, you break even on your first run around, okay? Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Now, as far as ceilings are concerned, as long as you know where the location is, you can make a map where the holes are for the ceiling and you can use a hole saw to drill those out, okay? After yeah, the fact. Back to it later. Do that after the fact, put the drill on reverse, 
so it doesn't grab the drywall paper and run across the ceiling. But if you drill in reverse on drywall with a hole saw, it makes it perfect every single time. Okay. okay. So just make a map, measure, and remember that when you measure later, you're gonna have a half inch drywall there. So you gotta adjust your memberships, your, your, your measurements a half an inch, right? Yeah. And then you can Perfect. just create that line. That way, when you're in there, if you have a laser, you can drop it on the floor and you have a straight line across your ceiling and all your holes are guaranteed to line up. And that's the yeah, other just, benefit of doing it after the fact. Yeah, just go back and make sure all the measurements are marked against the wall kind of thing or? Well, you just grab a piece of paper and you just mark out all the, all the center lines that you want, okay? Right. And yeah. then you drop a laser line and you measure off 36 and then six feet and then nine feet or whatever you're going to do. And then you can, you have that cross measurement. You can put a marker on all those cross dots, put your whole drill saw on reverse, drill all the holes out. The wires will be up there. You reach in, you can pull them out. And then if you're smart, you run your enough wire that you got two or three feet of extra wire. So that when you're wiring the box, you're doing it in front of your heart, looking down at it. Okay. Instead of over your head, wiring your box. Give yourself an extra couple of feet of wire so that you're not getting exhausted and putting a kink in your neck and passing out and working with your arms over your heart. It's extremely strenuous doing that. So just make sure you run all your pot lights with a little, couple extra feet of wire so you can work comfortably standing normal, looking down your hands in front of your heart. And you'd be surprised the difference that makes. Perfect. Thank all you. All right. Cheers, buddy. Take care. All right, Chris. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, there we go, it's 5.57. Guys, again, if you're looking for a, a side gig, we're gonna do a video soon. I'm gonna explain the benefit, all the different benefits. It's just really, really quick for you. You have money, you get paid from your job, you get taxed. The money that's left, you buy a cell phone, you buy internet service, you buy your vehicle, you buy your gas. All of those expenses can be moved over a new category of the money you make from your business before you're taxed, all of that money gets paid for those services first. That frees up your cash that you have, all right? And then if your business doesn't make any money, you can write that loss off against your taxes at your tax return time, just as a thought to get started. But take advantage of that great wisdom from Georgetown, you know, rent a tool or, or do a flyer drop or go by a neighborhood and say, hey, next Saturday I'm coming to aeration. Would you like to be signed up on the list? You don't have to rent the tool and then knock on doors. You can knock on doors and make a list of clients first. You can have 20 or 30 clients lined up before you rent the tool. Rent it for the whole day. Ha! Ah, all right. Well, listen, that's it for me today. I think this has been awesome. At the end of the day, guys, uh, it ain't what it used to be. You know, there was a day when I was in the trades where spitting a handshake did the job. It's not like that anymore. There's too much stress. Society is unwinding. Everybody's stressed. Everybody is like one piece of bad news away from going postal. So if you're gonna be doing business for people, make sure you're charging for it. Take a look at the value you bring to the marketplace. Charge current market rate for the increase in the value based on your work. That's what you're worth. Don't charge what you used to two years ago. You've gotta get up to modern standards, okay? At the end of the day, I don't care where you live, if you're gonna put in work and you're gonna put in $10,000 worth of equity into that home, you need to be charging 10 to 12,000 for your service. Because nobody should be making money off of your work in their home, okay? That's never happened before in history. Every contractor always made more money than the homeowner got value. That's normal. And if you're not charging at least what the market is and maybe a little bit more, you're undercharging. And the, there, there's a certain percentage of the population that's going to see that. And they're going to be like vultures. And they're going to prey on you. And you're going to work for free. And you're going to be like that electrician who's like having a hard time getting paid. Okay? If you don't come across like somebody who's getting paid at the top tier and you know the game, you're not going to get respect from your clients. Bottom line. Listen. It's a crazy world out there. And if you work in the trades, you, if you're one of these blood, sweat, and tears people, I don't care what job you do, anyone who gets their hands dirty and needs the orange soap at the end of the day is a brother to me, all right? Treat each other with respect. Give each other great deals. Give each other priority. Let the rest of the world that decided that you weren't worth their time and effort 
suffer and wait for weeks on end without getting their toilet plunged for all I care. They're going to get exactly what they asked for. Let's take care of each other and we'll let them pay us when they feel good and ready to pay top dollar. Ha ha ha. Cheers to next time. Jeff's out. Mm.